afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Faith Farms and Orchard uh, Progressive Community Church. I'm here at the farm. Excuse me, I'm here at the farm. Uh, Progressive Community Church Word on Wednesday. Just excited. Uh, one of our young workers and helpers here at the farm is just excited about some things. So I'm excited. Um, or Shane is his name. So I'm really grateful for Shane uh, for coming and sharing with us. Uh, on the farm uh, this summer. Uh, but we'll be in the book, uh, Journey of a Lifetime. It's a 52 week uh, study lesson through the entire Bible. If you don't have it, I encourage you to, to get it. Journey of a Lifetime, 52 week study lesson through the entire Bible by Pastor Tommy C. Hagel. Today we'll be actually in the book and we'll be on lesson 14 in the book, in lesson 14, it's page 61, uh, and actually it's, it's lesson 15, excuse me, page 65 will be in uh, the book of Job. So if you have your Bibles, grab your Bibles, because we will be diving into the Word of God, uh, exploring uh, some things from the book of Job. As many of you know, uh, Job is what uh, in theological circles are call, is called a theodicy. Theodicy simply means why does bad things happen to good people or why do good people suffer or go through bad things. And so that's a theodicy. That's what the book of Job helps us to explore. Um, we'll note that there is never really an answer <laughs> given uh, uh, by God or uh, provided in the story, but there are some lessons that we can learn as we examine Job's life and we look at uh, this question of the Odyssey through uh, what God allows to happen in Job's life. So that's lesson 15 um, in the book of Job uh, and that's where we'll be. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We pray now, God, that you would move in our life, move in our midst. We pray that you would help us on this day, oh God, as we come to study your word. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge into your holy word, oh God. And then God, help us to not only have understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, but to apply your word to our life. Let application be uh, also applicable in our life and to our life that we not just be hearers of your word but that we be faithful doers of your word so we thank you now God and we give you glory honor and praise in Jesus mighty name amen amen amen, amen. Um, we've been in the book of Job the last three weeks uh, we've gone through the first three chapters of Job, and we'll, we'll highlight some of that as we continue to go through the book. Uh, the book of Job deals with, the like I said earlier, the age-old question, why do good people suffer bad things? Within a short period of time, Job lost his family, his, his fortune, his wealth, his possession, his family, except his, his wife, and his health. Uh, but he didn't lose his faith. That's one thing we mm -hmm. talked about earlier. He lost all of those things, but he did not lose his faith. It looked as though God must have been punishing Job for some sin in his life, but God was not, but that was not the reason for Job's suffering. Uh, people have always wondered why good people experience awful disaster or terrible accident. This book explains that we do not always understand why things happen the way they do, and God is not obligated to explain them. Now that's one of the things that we'll uh, see as we go through, uh, as you read through the book of Job, that God is not obligated to share with you might ask, but it's not always God's uh, obligation to answer when you ask a question. God was honored by Job's suffering because Job remained faithful to the Lord in the midst of the most discouraging circumstances. That's what we said. He lost his family, he lost his fortune, but he never lost his faith. And that's one of the things that, that we can glean uh, from this book, how to remain faithful through whatever it is that you go through. Amen? Amen. 
it's easy to be faithful to God as long as everything is going the way we want it. Good income, a nice home, a healthy family. However, it is not so easy to be faithful and to praise God in the midst of human suffering and tragedies. The study of Job will help us accept and understand the tragedies of life. Accept and understand the tragedies of life. Brief outline of the book, uh, chapters 1 through 3, which we've gone through already. We'll deal with them uh, really quickly. Deals with Job's trials. Uh, chapters 4 through uh, 37, the second section, Job and the advice of his friends. And then the third section is Job's deliverance, chapters 38 through 42, Job's deliverance. Job's trials, chapters 1 through 3. Job was a man of great wealth and influence, perfectly, uh, apparently famous for his goodness and integrity. Um, and the enemy comes, Satan makes an accusation against Job in chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. Uh, he says, Does Job fear you for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he had on every side. That was Satan's accusation that the only reason that Job was worshiping God and praising God was because God was giving him stuff. Mm. That was his accusation. And after obtaining God's permission, uh, we talked about this, Satan brings up enemies to carry away Job's oxen, asses, and camels. His sheep are killed by lightning. Then Job's seven sons and three daughters are killed. Uh, and it happens because a great wind came across the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on them. So he got calamity, as we normally say. Everything was coming from every side, from the north and the south and the east and the west. It seemed like he could not catch a break, in other words, in Job's life. Yet in the midst of all these tragedies, Job remains faithful to the Lord and praises his name. And he teaches us how you can remain faithful in tragic situations. How do you do it? By understanding that everything that we have belongs to God. That's what we deduce. That's what we shared as we looked at the end of uh, uh, chapter one, that everything belonged. God, uh, Job understood that he was just a steward over everything that God had blessed him with, that he was simply a steward. And if you know that you're a steward and that it doesn't belong to you, then you can, like Job, understand that it all belongs to God and do like Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Still blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because it does not belong to me. I'm just a steward over what God has provided. Therefore, Satan approaches God again a second time because he said first time, if you take away the stuff, only reason that he's worshiping you, the only reason that he is uh, uh, faithful to you is because you bless him with stuff. He said, but if you take away the stuff, he'll curse you to your face. Find out that he, he, he uh, allows the enemy to take away the stuff. He doesn't curse God. What does he do? He blesses God. Amen. He continues to bless the Lord. Again, in the midst of, um, therefore, Satan approaches God again to obtain permission to test Job further. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. We went through it. After receiving God's permission, what does Satan do to Job? In chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, he inflicted Job with loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. God allows the adversary uh, to hurt his body, but he cannot take his life. Mm -hmm. All right? That, that, that's God allowed the enemy to afflict his body, to touch his body, to hurt his body, but he gave him. Remember, we talked about uh, uh, God puts limits, amen, on what the enemy is able to to do and here is a perfect example of the limit first he put a limit he put a limit he said only thing you can do is is impact the stuff but you can't touch him put limit 
and, then, and, and, and then he put a limit on what he could do when he touched Job's life. You could touch his life, you could hurt him, but you cannot take his life. God places limits. We, didn't, we, didn't, we say he places limits on what he can do to us, but then, excuse me, God also places <coughs> limits on how long it will last. Amen. And that's why they, uh, the, I believe they composed that old song. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Weeping may endure for a night, but all joy will come in the morning. My good king, Dr. King, asked a simple question, how long the night? Because sometimes it feels like the night lasts forever. But, but God helps us to understand and we learn from Job that, that yes, it might last a little while, but it don't last forever. Amen. Yeah. That, that, that God can and God will change the situation. He'll turn it around. Amen. Yeah. And he'll turn it around for our good. So we see that uh, uh, he allows, God allows in chapter 2. He allows the enemy to afflict his body, but he puts limits on him. You can afflict his body, but you cannot take his life. And he put limits on that. Uh, uh, Job is so horrible to look at, his wife cannot bear it anymore. Therefore, she advises him in verse chapter 2, verse 9. Somebody pull it up. Give us what she advised her husband to do. Job chapter 2, verse 9. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Yeah, she, she comes to him and says, why are you still holding on to your faith after all that has happened to you? Look at you, man. You look a mess. Curse God and die. We talked about that. We said there are probably two reasons or two things that we should consider about Miss Job. She don't have a name. We'll call her Miss Job. Two things we ought to consider about Job's wife. The first thing uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, folks often talk about is her, um, how God, how the enemy will use people closest to you to get you to do something against God. We said, here is his wife, the closest thing to him, who comes to him and, and if we're not careful, we will say she is working for the enemy. Because what does the enemy tell God that Job will do? He said, say it again. He will curse you to your face. And now we see Miss Job, his wife, comes along. And it looks like she's doing the work of the enemy. We don't want to move sight of that. Because oftentimes the enemy will use those that are closest to you to get you to do something contrary to the will of God. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. But then the second thing we looked at and we said, but maybe, just maybe, because Job wasn't the only one that was suffering. Miss Job lost some kids. Mm -hmm. Amen. Miss Job uh, uh, lost status. Amen. Miss mm -hmm. Job mm -hmm. lost some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. She lost cattle. Amen. She lost her fortune. And so, and so oftentimes we, we, we deduce that maybe the, what she spoke was out of her hurt. And oftentimes when we speak out of our hurt, we say some hurtful things. Amen. We say hurtful things to people that we all might not say, but for the hurt that we are experiencing. And I just believe, that's what I believe. She was experiencing uh, some hurt. She was hurting. She was angry. Amen. And hurting. And that, 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 that combination uh, caused her to say some things that she would normally not have said if she wasn't having a moment. Because she was hurting too. Yeah. Yeah. And probably she was, it's all your fault, Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's hurting. And she speaks. I just believe she's speaking out of our hurt. And we said uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, that you got to be careful when you're hurting what you say. Yeah. You got to be you got to be able to try to, uh, as the Bible says, control your tongue. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because because you can injure somebody. By the words that you say. You know the old stand, sticks and stones, break my bones. 
But words are never hurt. I don't believe that. I think words hurt boy. <laughs> Sticks and stones, it. you can get over that. Okay. All right. But I think words, and we understand what the Bible says that words, power, life, and death. Yeah. Where? In the tongue. Words have the ability to heal or to hurt. Yeah, and so she uses these words. I believe she's speaking out of a place where she is hurting. And she don't know what to say or what to do. And she just simply asked her husband in chapter 2, Job chapter 2, verse 9, to curse God and die. And die. Why are you still being faithful to God in the midst of of everything that you've gone through. Clearly God don't like you. You ought to curse God and die. Again, two, two ways. I've always heard it preached. The first way I, 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 I talk, I shared with you that, that the enemy uses those closest to you to, 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 to get you to do something that you wouldn't normally do. But then as I was studying this, God just gave that revelation that maybe it wasn't that, that, maybe it was her own hurt. And what we do when we hurt. Hurt others. Yeah, we, we lash out. Maybe she was lashing out because she was in pain and she didn't know how to deal with it. Amen. Amen. Because we've all been there. But we have painful moments. We don't know how to deal with it. And so we just say stuff. Yeah, we wish we can do what? <laughs> Put the words back in. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't take them back once you said them. Now you can try to apologize. Amen. You can try to, to make it right in that way, but you can't take them back once they've been put out. So here it is, chapter 2. Uh, uh, Job, is. we see, she tells us that Job is still holding on to his faith. Chapter 1, God said he's still holding on. Job said it. And chapter 2, she explains that Job is still holding on to his faith in spite of. But then the friends came along at the end of chapter 2, and they didn't even recognize who Job was. His boils and, and, uh, were all over his body that they could not even recognize him. They got to the place where they got where Job was, and they just sat there. because They didn't know what to say. And every now and then, that's what you ought to do. <laughs> you just ought to sit there. I, I wish they would have just kept that. Because in chapters 4 and section 2, we'll see that they then opened their mouth and it all went downhill from there. Mm -hmm. but, but in chapter 2, they showed up. They got there. They didn't know what to say because it, it looked so bad. In fact, at the end of chapter 2, they, 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 they didn't say anything, but their actions showed what they thought about him. Somebody uh, read uh, the last two or three verses of the end of chapter two. Tell us what verse it is. Um, 13. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back. Joe, Joe was shamed that they could scarcely recognize yes. him. Wailing loudly in despair, they tore their robes and thrust dust into the air and put earth on their heads to demonstrate their sorrow. Yeah. Then they sat upon the ground with him silently for seven days and nights, no one speaking a word, for they saw that his sufferings were too great for words. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. They show up. They see him. They don't even recognize who he is. They show up. And immediately they start crying and wailing. They tore their clothes. They put on ashes. What they're essentially saying is Job is dead. What they're essentially saying is Job ain't gonna make it. Mm. Yeah. That, that's what they're saying. So they didn't say it out loud, but their actions speak what's in their heart and on their mind. They ain't even said it to each other, they just looked at each other. <laughs> Job ain't gonna make it, y'all. And, and, and the question that we asked a couple of weeks ago, we gotta be careful. Because our actions sometimes speak louder than our words. And here it is. Joe wasn't dead, but they had already buried him. Mm -hmm. mm. Joe was still living, but they would already put him in the grave. 
They sat there with him for a period of mourning. Because they're like, Job ain't going to make it. He's in hospice. Job ain't going to make it. And we got to be careful about putting people in the grave too soon. Amen. 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 Because God has the final word. That's right. Yeah, not you, not That's me. Right. God has the first word and the last word. In fact, God has the only word. Everybody else is just opinion. It ain't fact. God is the only one with what? Facts. Everybody else thinking what they think they know. That's what they did. They thought what they saw looked like something, but it was not. And we got to be careful. At the end of chapter 2, we got to be careful. In chapter 3, we see Job's suffering is so severe he wishes he had never been born or had died at birth. In fact, he, he even wished that, um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that he had been aborted. And it's not uncommon for a godly man to want to die. If we look in the scripture, it's replete with examples. Moses asked God to take his life in Numbers chapter 11, verses 10 through 15. It's replete. While hiding from Jezebel, Elijah asked to die in 1 Kings 9. Go home and read it when you get home. So it's not uncommon that Job also asked God, take my life, God. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be here. I'm not going to take my life, but God, you, I wish I've never been born. The word why is used at least five times in chapter three. Job does not understand why God let these things happen to him. Job's experience is one we all face at one time or another in life. But if you were here Wednesday or, or Sunday, um, when we become perplexed, we need to remember it's Romans 8 and 28. And if somebody can get that and read it, in fact, that was one of the word in the heart scriptures, so all of you all should know it by heart. But just in case you don't, you can go to Romans 8 and 28. Amen. If you don't, I would encourage you to learn this. This is, uh, 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 if you were here Sunday, in Ephesians, we talked about it in chapter 11. So if somebody want to get Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it essentially says the same thing as Romans 8 and 28. And when you get it, somebody read it out loud. Romans 8 and 28 and then Ephesians 1 and 11. When we become perplexed, we need to remember Romans 8 and 28. Somebody got it? <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and in those who are the calling according to his purpose. Yeah. And we know that all things, he didn't say some things, Paul is writing uh, this uh, to this church in Rome, work together that God works all things out. It's the power of God. Look at Ephesians 1 11. And we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own. Who works according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That God is at work. That's essentially what 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 it what we are seeing here. That no matter how perplexed we might become, no matter how shaken we might become because of what we might go through, if we understand that all things work together for good, that God is working it out, even though it might not look like it. Amen? Okay. Yeah. It works together for good to those who love God. There's a prerequisite for God working it out. You got to love God. Amen? I think Mary Mary put it, I love God. You don't love God, what's wrong with you? Oh, you got to love God. If you want to see God work all things out, you got to love God. Why? Because God first loved you. God first loved me. That's what 1 John tells us, that we didn't first love God. God first loved us. God loved us so much that John 3.16 said that he gave his only begotten son. We got to love those who love God. And who are the called according to his purpose, not your own purpose, not your own plan, will, or desire. What God's plan is, who are the called according to his purpose. In other words, God is working it out. 
Amen. Amen. That, that's what Job, uh, we got to understand when we ha are in situations and, and in, uh, experiencing things that Job has experienced is that, that all things work together for good and that God will work it out. Amen. You got to believe that. You, you got to believe. You got to believe that. That God will work everything out no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what people are saying and sharing, that God will work it out. Here it is according to how God wants to see it worked out. Mm -hmm. Amen. You might have a way that you want to see it, but God going to work it out according to God's plan. Amen. Don't, 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 don't get discouraged because it ain't work out the way you want it to work, be worked out. Amen. Because when God works it out, it's for your good. Amen. You might not recognize it at the time, but, but you might, it might be five years, seven years, ten years down the road where you able to look back and say, oh God, thank you for working it out like this. Because the way I wanted you to work it out, it wouldn't have ended up like this, God. Amen. It would have ended up in a totally different way. But God, I thank you that you are more, hallelujah, that you are an all-wise God. Hallelujah. I thank you that you worked it out, which means you're an all-powerful God. Hallelujah. I thank you that, that, Lord, you saw what I was going through, so you're an all-seeing God. Hallelujah. I thank you that you worked it out according to your will and plan. When we walk with God and try to lead good Christian life, here it is. Satan will do everything in his power to break our fellowship with God. You want to know why uh, it may be that you're going through something, some things you're going through because the enemy don't like that you got a relationship with God. Mm. Amen. But you just keep on holding on to your relationship Amen. with God. Amen. Amen. Don't ever lose your relationship with God. Because some people go through tragic situations. The first thing they do is they run away from God. Amen. I've seen it over and over again in this church. People go through things and they run from God. Baby, that ain't the time to run from God. That's the time to get closer to God. Amen. When life happens, that's the time that you double down on your faith with God. Not, not throw in the towel and turn it over to somebody else and try to figure it out by yourself. No, that's the time that we ought to say, God, I'm here. That's it. Like never before. Yes, Lord. Yeah, that's the time when when we are not break fellowship. That's the time we try to strengthen our fellowship. Because here it is, God allows things. So anything that happens in your life, hallelujah, it cannot happen if God didn't allow it. And what did we say? You got a hedge around you. You got a fence around you. And God put on the fence. What did we say? Put on the fence. There's a sign on your fence. What does the sign say? No trespassing. Ah. Amen. No trespassing. Ah. So if God didn't allow it to happen, then you have authority to the stuff that God didn't allow to say, enemy, what? Get out of my life. Mm -hmm. You're trespassing where? On private property. Yeah. Because God put up a hedge around you. God put up a fence around you. And chapter 1 says it ain't just around you, but everything that concerns you. God put a fence around you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the fence around my children. Thank you, Lord, for the fence around everything that concerns me. Yeah, my property got a fence around it. My business got a fence around it. Amen. Everything that concerns me, God has placed the hedge all around it. Amen. And if the enemy, because sometimes the enemy will show up when he ain't supposed to. We looked at it in chapter 1. We looked at the storm that showed up. Remember when Jesus was sleeping in the hinder part of the boat? Amen. And a storm arose, a great storm, and the disciples were distressed, and they thought they were going to die. But they went to the bottom of the boat, and they asked Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? Jesus didn't talk to them. He got up. He spoke to the wind and the wave. You all know, what did he say? Peace, be still. And what happened? The wind and the wave, they ceased. 
And then Jesus looked at them, said, oh, ye of little faith. You all had enough faith to speak to it because it wasn't supposed to be here in the first place. But you didn't what? Use your faith. God has given each of us authority through Jesus to speak to those things that ought not be in our lives so that they will move. Amen. But then there are times, we said there was another time, Jesus sent them out to be tempted, to be tested. Mm. He sent them in a boat. He said, you all go over there and I'll meet you there. In the middle of the night, storms rose. And it was for them to be, uh, 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 the storms to challenge their faith. And Jesus got out and he was walking on the water. Remember mm -hmm. that? He got done praying. He came out to them walking on the water. They thought it was a ghost. Yeah. But Jesus was walking as if it, Jesus didn't stop the storm. He was still walking in the storm. And then Peter, he, Peter said, Lord, if it be you, tell me to get out of the boat and come walk on water with you. Mm -hmm. Jesus said simply, come. He got out of the boat. He began to do what? Walk on water in the middle of what? A storm. Which meant that Jesus, God, didn't want the storm to go away. He wanted them to see that you can still have faith even through the stuff that you're going through. Yeah. Amen. You ain't got to lose your faith in a storm. Right. In fact, you can walk in the midst of your storm and it not affect you. Mm -hmm. If you do what? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes on the Lord. He kept his eyes on the Lord. As long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, he didn't even recognize that the storm was around him. And then a big, big wave hit. And then he turned his eyes from Jesus and he began to sink, the Bible says. And he cried out, Lord, have mercy. Here it is. Jesus reached out his arm, lifted him up. It was still storming. They got into the boat. It wasn't until they got into the boat that the storm ceased. Because Jesus had, they had, he, he had taught them the lesson that he was trying to teach them, hallelujah, about storms. But he allowed it to happen in their life. There are some things that God will allow to happen. That's what Job's experience tells us, that there are some things that God allows to happen in our lives. But here it is, if God allows it to happen in your life, God, there is a purpose for it. Amen. There's a purpose for everything that God allows to happen in our lives. Second thing we need to understand that when God allows and there's a purpose for everything, that God, just like Jesus, when he walked to them on water, was in complete control. Amen. He was still in control because it did not affect him. The storm didn't affect Jesus. He walked on water in the midst of a storm. And it had no effect on him. Which means that he was what? In control. Mm. And so you need to realize, understand and recognize that God is still in control. No matter what it is that he allows to happen in your life. God is in control. Second section, Job and the advice for his friends. This is, uh, we're going to look at a whole lot. Uh, chapters 4 uh, through 37. Go home and read it when you can. Uh, chapter 4 starts the conversation I told you all. I wish they would have just shut up. They started out good even though their actions didn't portray hallelujah it because they were saying by their action, Job, you getting ready to die, brother. You ain't going to be with us very much longer. In this section, chapters 4 through 37, of the book, there are six characters. There's Job, there's Eliphaz, there's Bildad, there's Zophar, there's Elihu, and there is God. And each of them share. Central theme of their dialogue is why does God allow the righteous to suffer? On page 67, if you're in the book, uh, Job's friends come to console him, but instead they end up criticizing him. You ever had some people end up uh, uh, doing one thing even though they came to do something else. Mm -hmm. They came because they said, we're going to try to cheer Job up. By the time uh, uh, they left, 
Job wasn't feeling, he was feeling worse off than when they came. Amen. And people who come into your life, they're going to do one thing. When they leave, you wish they never came. Yeah. Amen. That's how Job's three friends, four friends are. Uh, the first three, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, have the same answer. Though in different terminology, basically they say God blesses the righteous and God chastises the wicked. Mm -hmm. Therefore, since Job has been afflicted, Job must have did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so here they are theorizing what Job must have done in order for him to be afflicted by God. They say, Job, ain't no way. God is righteous. And we what we know about God is that God blesses those who are righteous and he chastises those that are wicked. That, that, that's their argument to Job, that Job, you, you can't be serious, Job, that you, you got some secret sin and your secret sin been found out. Mm. You looked all holy and, and righteous, but you weren't really that. That's chapters 4 through 37, if you go and read, that's really what they're saying to Job. And Job is responding there are some things that you are not respond to. Amen. There are some people who will come into your life who will accuse you of things that you know you haven't done. And the best thing is not to get into a, a verbal sparring match with them. Amen. Don't, don't go toe for toe and tit for tat and one up and, and try to explain yourself when you know you're in the right. Right. That's what Job was doing. He's trying to explain himself. No, no, I haven't done anything wrong. I don't know why God, I wish God would show up and tell me why God is allowing this stuff to happen in my life. But I don't know, but, but it ain't because I've done something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, he's being chastised by God. Hmm. And they say the only reason that God chastises people is because they do something bad. That's their theology. Yeah, that's their theology. God blesses good people. God, God, God uh, chastises bad people. We'd all be in a world of trouble, boy. <laughs> yeah, if that was the case and how God operated. If God didn't have grace and mercy, we'd all be in a world of trouble. If, 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 if being blessed depended on how good we were, my God. We, we miss out on a whole lot of blessings. Amen. But thanks be to God for grace. Thanks be to God for his mercy. It's because of his mercy, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So that was their, uh, therefore, since Job has been afflicted, they, they, they deduced. They came to the conclusion that Job must, Job, you 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 seem to be upright, mm -hmm. but but you you got some skeletons in your closet. You must be doing something that, that ain't nobody know about, but you can't get away from God. And that in theory, that's right. That that God knows all, God sees all, but 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 their theology isn't right. That's the first three friends. They they, they, they talk a whole lot. Uh, and then while these three men argue God, Job's suffering is because of his sin, the fourth friend, Elihu, who Elihu comes, and Elihu is younger than Job and the rest of these guys. Mm -hmm. So Elihu says, man, all y'all old guys talking all this, this stuff about that, that ain't the reason why. Let me break it down for y'all. In, in our language, mm -hmm. the young people language, what's really going on with this matter. Uh, he adds some insight to the debate. What does he say? Somebody, uh, I'll read it for sake of time. We'll go home and read uh, Job 33, 9 through 20. He essentially says that God does not unfairly test his children and he speaks to us in, tra in tragedy if we will listen. Go home and read chapter 33, verses 9 through 20. You will hear this young person's uh, insight as to what's happening in God's, in Job's life. That God does not unfairly test his children. Essentially what he says, 
and he speaks to us in tragedy if we will listen, that God won't unfairly test us. Then after that, because Job continues to tell them, I wish God was here. I would ask God myself mm -hmm. what it is and why it is. Y'all will find out that I ain't done nothing wrong. I don't know, but if God was here, I would ask God. So he asked and he received. Mm -hmm. Chapter 38 through 42 speaks about Job's deliverance. After each of the first three friends speak, Job replies. However, after Elihu's speech, God replies. Chapter 38, verse 1. Somebody read chapter 38, verse 1. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of his whirlwind and said, who is it that darkness comprehends? Thy words without knowledge. Who, who, who is asking these questions and don't understand the answers that you're asking me? Words that you don't even understand. You keep going. Now prepare yourself, O man. I will question you and you shall have some rain. So will you that I laid the foundation of the all right, stop right there. Now, now get ready, since you're a man. <laughs> get ready, because I've got some questions for you. Get ready to see if you can respond to the questions. And, and he goes through in chapter 38 and chapter 39 and chapter 40, and God just lays out a litany of questions and things that God has done. And he asked, where were you when I put the sun and the stars and the moon in the sky. Where were you? He asked him all of these questions. He said, since you think you so smart. Mm. Amen. Since you think you know it all. Come and answer these questions. Job has challenged God to speak to him. Beginning in chapter 38, God speaks to Job. Here it is, out of a whirlwind. He asked Job a series of simple questions about where he was when God made the world, the stars, light, and darkness. He asked Job what he knows about wild creatures such as the lion and the wild ass, the ostrich or the eagle. In essence, God asked Job, since you know so much about how I should do things, can you run the universe that I created? Mm. So now, here it is. And some people say, uh, and I grew up in a house that they, we were told, you can't, you don't question God. I grew up in a house that, that told us that. But, but here, Job questions God. All right, so I don't know your theology, but, but here it is. Job questioned God, and, and God uh, uh, comes back and asks him a bunch of questions. Uh, uh, and, and so it might be okay to ask questions of God, but you'd better be prepared. Amen. You better be doggone prepared to, 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 to hear what God got to say to you. I don't think Joe was prepared, quite prepared. Chapters 40 and 41, God continues to question Joe to see if he thinks he is God's equal and if she, he should question God's justice. Because that's what he was doing. He was questioning the justice of God. Yeah, the righteousness. Justice simply means God's righteousness. God, are you a righteous? Are you righteous? He's here questioning God's righteousness. God has Job consider two more of God's creations, the behemoth or the hippopotamus in 40 and 15, and the leviathan. A lot of people struggle with what a leviathan is, but here, the author here says it's a crocodile. In verses 4, uh, chapter 41 and 1, some to consider the Leviathan a, a, a great, huge beast uh, in the ocean that, 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 that we don't see anymore. And God notes man's utter inability to control these animals. He said, you can't control the hippopotamus. You can't control the crocodile. Mm. What folly is it then for man to question the God who made them? You ought to be prepared if you're going to ask question to God, to, to, for God to ask question of you. 
and then you ought to be prepared to be to look shameful because you can't answer the question that God is going to ask you. Amen. So you might as well not question God. Amen. What is Job's reaction to all of this in chapter 42, verse 6? Somebody grab chapter 2, verse 6. Somebody grab chapter 42, verse 10. Somebody grab chapter 42, verse 16. Somebody grab Psalm 19 and 10, the A part of the verse. Chapter 42, verse 6. What is Job's reaction to all of this? He said, therefore, I adore myself and repent in the dust and ashes. He's ashamed. He repents in, in dust and ashes. He's sorry. The repentant dust and ashes means I am heartily sorry. God, I am, I'm sorry in my heart. I shouldn't have done that. He is ashamed of himself and he repents in dust and ashes. Yeah, because if you go before that in chapter 2, 42, verses 1 through 5, you'll see why uh, uh, after reading. The book of Job does not give the answer to the problem of suffering. I talked about that earlier. There is never an answer given to the age-old question. This is, Job is considered uh, uh, one of uh, probably the first books, one of the first things that happen in life. Uh, is 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 what's happening here with Job? It's age old question. People all people since the beginning of time have been trying to answer the question: Why does why do bad things happen to good people? Job, we never get an answer in the book of Job. Never get an answer to the question: Why does bad things happen to good people? So but it huh? where is the answer in the Bible? But it does declare God is so great, no answer is needed. Oh, okay. Since the answer would be impossible for man's finite mind to understand. In other words, there are some things that are above your pay grade. Mm. Put it in our own terms. There are some things that the Bible said is too wonderful for me to understand and to comprehend. Mm -hmm. That even if God gave it to me, it would drive me crazy. <laughs> I couldn't understand it even if God tried to share it with me. Because my mind cannot operate and understand on that level. And so I just got to accept some things. I got to accept, as one song says, what God allows. Amen. I just got to take it by faith that God knows what is best for my life. Amen. After rebuking Job's friend, <laughs> God restores Job's possession. How much does God give Job? Verse 42 and 10. Chapter 42, verse 10. How much does God give Job? Chapter 42, verse 10. Uh, then, then, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his wealth and happiness. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. All right. Twice as much as before. God told his friends, y'all go, because y'all, y'all, if, if not, if, if Job won't pray for you all, y'all won't make it. So they went. Job prayed for them. Uh, uh, and then God blessed him after he prayed for them. Uh, even though they uh, said some things that were harmful and hurtful, Job still prayed for. Yeah, I missed it. Okay, let me see. Okay. Even though they said some things that, that made Job upset, even so they, they said some things that, that, that impinged on Job's reputation, Job still prayed for. Okay, yeah. There may be some people who have hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. There may be some people who have made you angry. Mm -hmm. There may be some people who made, who gotten on your last nerves and made you lay down your living. Mm -hmm. But God says, pray for them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because here it is. 
He got blessed after he prayed for them. Some of you all are missing out on the blessings of God because you holding a grudge against somebody else. God want to bless you. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me go call a couple. Hallelujah. <laughs> God wants to bless you. But there are some things God can't bless you with because you have not prayed and forgiven the ones that have hurt you. Amen. Yes. Um, Pastor, I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I, you know, I have foster parents and, and I had this one little boy yeah. that had just the last one that mm -hmm. you say is mm -hmm. Well, ended up pulled down my nerves so bad and he had done some things that just was not right. And I really ate him up. Mm. No words, whatever. You give him the words, son of God. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. I did, I asked God to forgive me for that. And I prayed for him because I knew then that this child has some issues. Hurt. He has some issues. But he hurt me and well, I retaliated. Yeah, what did we say? Hurt. He was hurt he like was Joe's hurt. wife. Mm -hmm. And she said, go curse God and die. And that's what the curse said to kill me. Yeah. And I just lit it in. Ooh. And then I thought about it. Then I went and said, Lord, forgive me. Amen. Forgive me. And I started praying for him. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be foster parenting anymore because it's beginning to take a toll. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not that type of person. And I don't do that for children. Yeah. And he had just taken me mm. to... He just took me over the hill. Over the hill. And I said, I am not going to let you do this to me. And I'm glad you prayed. I'm okay. glad you prayed for him. God will bless you. That, he, he, he didn't get blessed. If you go back and read chapter 42, verses 1 through 10, God lays out to him what he's supposed to do. It's on him if he doesn't. He doesn't get blessed with double if he doesn't do it. Amen. You aren't let now. Now here it is. Here's the other piece. You aren't doing it to to be blessed. All right. So don't run out of here saying I'm gonna be God gonna bless me if I do this. All right. That ain't the that ain't the reason why you're doing it. Amen. Amen. But you should do it. One because it's the right thing to do. Because God said I forgave you. You ought to forgive others. Just like I've forgiven you. You ought to forgive somebody else. Can't say amen, say out. All right. What else does God double for Job? Psalm 90 and 10, a part of the verse. Job 42 and 16. And 16? Mm -hmm, 42 and 16. Somebody get Psalm 90 and 10. Psalm 90 and 10. Oh, you 10. said 16. Job 42 and 16. Oh, Job lived 140 years after that, living to see his grandchildren and great-grandchildren too. Mm -hmm. Then at last he died, an old, old man after living a long, good life. All right, Psalm 40. Okay. I mean, Psalm 90 and 10, sorry. Psalm 90 and 10, the eighth part of the verse. Psalm 90 and 10. And we're almost done. Days of our years are uh, three score years mm -hmm. and ten. Three score is sixty. A score is twenty years. Mm -hmm. So three score will be sixty. Three uh, and ten is seventy. Mm -hmm. So seventy. Anytime beyond seventy, you're living on God's grace. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three score and ten. So life expectancy, because this was written by Moses. This this psalm is attributable to Moses. So life expectancy is 70 years. How long did he live? 140 years. Double. Double. All right. That's what I wanted. He got double lifespan for what he had gone through. God blessed him. Amen. In that way. There are many wonderful lessons to be learned from the book of Job. For example, when theology gets in the way of compassion for human suffering, something needs to be revived. Job's friends seem to have been more interested in the theological aspects of his suffering than in Job himself. They were more interested in the why he was suffering than in him. Mm. 
they came to console him. They saw what was happening to him and said the only thing reason this happened is because you sinned. They were more interested in trying to find out his sin mm -hmm. than to trying to help their friend. Amen. They were more interested in trying to find out his dirt than trying to help their friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they got cloudy by what they saw. Don't get cloudy by what you see. Amen. Don't, don't, don't try to be trying to get in their closet and figure out what they done did wrong. You, you got to sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. Amen. Don't try to come and uncover uh, uh, what I've done. If you're going to come and be a friend, be a friend. If you ain't going to come and be a friend, don't show up. Stay at home. I don't need you. Amen. Here it is. Another truth to be learned. Not everyone who suffers in the will of God will be rewarded in this life. So don't, don't think just because you're suffered that God is going to reward you with something in this life. Amen. That's 1 Peter 3 and 7. We can read that. And finally, this book teaches we can have peace in the midst of the storms of life. Not because we are anticipating an award, a reward for our suffering, but because the, the Lord has a purpose for everything that happens in our life. Take comfort that God has a purpose, God has a plan, and that God is still in control. No matter what it is that we're going through, God has a purpose for it. He might not reveal the purpose to us. But God has a purpose. He might not reveal his plan, but God has a plan. And God is still in control. God never gives up control. Yeah. This, this, this book looks at the permissive will of God. God has a permissive will. Permissive simply means he gives and grants permission. He granted permission to the adversary to afflict Job. God has a permissive will. What God allows according to his will is permissive. And there's a purpose for everything. God is still in control and God will work it all out. Don't forget Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to them who are the call according to his purpose. Don't forget that. Put that scripture in your heart and whatever you might be going through, understand that God is working it out for my good. Somebody ought to just say that God is working it out. God working it out. Working it out. For my good. Now help somebody else and tell them God is working it out. God is working it out. For your good. Tell somebody else God is working it out. For your good. Amen. God is working it out for your good. Here it is. It might not seem like it, but He's working it out for my good. It might not feel like it, but He's working it out. For my good. Amen? Amen. And for his glory. God's going to get glory out of what you're going through. Amen. Amen. God's going to be praised out of what you're going through. Amen. Because here it is. At the end of it, you're not going to look like what you've been through. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. They're not going to be able to tell what I've been through because God is working it out. Well, oh, my God. Father God, we thank you. We bless you and we praise you today, God, that you're working it all out for our good, God. We thank you, oh God, that you allow, that, that you trust us enough, God, that, 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 we, that, that we will hold on to our faith like Job held on to his faith, God. That, that, that we trust you enough that you trust us. And we thank you for having trust and having faith in us. That you can allow things to happen in our life, God. And we not get bent out of shape. And we not break, we not bend, we not bow to what it is that we are going through. But today, God, help us to stand on our faith. 
Help us to do like Peter, to get out of the boat, mm -hmm. even though it's still storming, yeah. and to keep our eyes stayed on you. Help us not to falter, God, like Peter faltered, mm -hmm. but to keep our eyes stayed on you and to walk with you in spite of everything else that's going on around and get grant us that peace God yes. that your word says surpasses all of our understanding yes. and guards our hearts and our minds yes. through and in Christ Jesus we thank you oh God that you're doing a new thing it's for our good it's for your glory and so now God we praise you in advance and we give your name glory honor and praise and say that it is so in Jesus' mighty name. Bless now, God, someone who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Because of this word, we pray that someone will come to know you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing with us today. Those in the virtual church, those in the visible church, thank you for coming and worshiping and sharing with us today in another edition of Word on Wednesday. If this ministry, if this word has been a blessing to you, consider sharing a, a love offering, a gift with us. You can go to the cash app. It's the dollar sign PCC Gary and sow your seed. Also consider coming back and joining us for our Sunday morning worship starting at 1030 a.m. with Sunday school. 11.15 a.m. with our Sunday morning worship. God is doing a new thing in this place, and you ought to get on board with what God is doing. Thank you for sharing. We'll see you soon. Peace.